Hello and welcome to HTML and CSS week three. Today we are going to be jumping into one of the most complicated aspects of CSS. Unfortunately, that complicated aspect is layout and positioning, which is pretty necessary for, well, writing websites. You need to be able to position and lay things out appropriately. I want to lay something down here really fast, and I said this before the video and I want to repeat it. When we get into layout and positioning with CSS, it is a very complicated topic to dive into in an, using an academic approach. Um, the rules that web browsers use to position elements are not trivial. However, if you know a few basics and you know a few properties and you've memorized a few techniques, it typically is possible for a person to get the layout that they want using CSS and HTML. The more times you do that, the faster that process will be. So yes, the, the individual properties that I'm going to be talking about are going to be going to seem very, very complex. And that's because they are, but there's no way around it. Um, Positioning and layout is just going to be the most complicated and the most powerful feature of CSS, and you won't be able to write any website without at least a working knowledge of how to play around with it. And that's what I want to accomplish. I want to show people, okay, well, if you're running into this problem, then then maybe you should try using a clear fix or an overflow hidden, or if you want this element to appear over here, use a float left or a float right. And I want to show people the things, the tools that they can use to play around with stuff until it looks the way they want it to. I do not expect that a person will develop a conceptual model of the box model, box model after watching this video or really any video. It's such a complicated topic that it's going to take some time to get used to it. Um, that in mind, you could certainly go to the W3C specification of the box model and read the highly academic text about how browsers are supposed to render things. But again, that, that, that is even a more difficult way to learn this. The best way to learn positioning in CSS is to get a few fundamentals down and then learn the tools that you can use to just play with the layout until you get it the way you want. So what we're going to be putting together today is a style for our to-do application. And you'll notice that right now it really does look a whole lot like a actual web page. But it's funny that if I jump into the actual source of this and I um, I remove the link tag at the top so I get rid of all of the CSS that's being applied to it and we come back here and hit F5, if you look at it, it's, it looks pretty simple actually. Um, the actual HTML is just straight up, you know, we have some OLs here, we have some H1 tags here, um, we have some other H1 tags here, we have a footer tag down here. It's all just normal HTML. But with the power of CSS, we are able to take those elements and turn them into what looks like a application. So we're going to go ahead and do that. <laughs> so again, just a reminder, this is going to be, this will blow everybody's brains like it will. Um, it's not intuitive. Unfortunately, the way that the CSS box model is not intuitive. It doesn't follow simple rules, but we're going to be talking about some stuff that we can play with. Um, yes, someone pointed out that this application does not have any functionality. It doesn't. Um, you might see, hey, if you hover over an item, you get a little pop-up menu. Um, that's done entirely in CSS. There is no actual behavior in this application whatsoever. So let's start off with, I want to go ahead and start off with something really fun. I want to get my header in place minus the navigation bar, and then I want to get my little sidebars down here in place. We'll be spending the majority of the time uh, talking about these three boxes, as these three boxes have the most advanced styling in them. But let's go ahead and get the header in place minus the navigation, as well as our body. And so that should be pretty pretty fun to, uh, to do. But first, we have to back back up into some ac academia. There are some terms that people are going to have to learn and memorize, and three terms in particular. 
So I'm going to go ahead and start up uh, an example 2.html and I'm going to create a styles2.css and then I'm going to edit both of these files. So I'm going to have these up here in my little tabs. I'll start off by copying and pasting the header for this document because that's what I always do. I never write this out myself. I don't know why you would have to, ever. And so we have a to-do application that links to styles2.css. That's all we have at this point. So basic HTML document, we have our doc type at the top, we have our HTML element, we have our head element, our body element. Our head element has a character set definition, a title, and a style sheet. This is pretty much the minimum HTML that you would need to use. In fact, I recommend typing this out and putting it somewhere that's easy to copy and paste. So let's take a look at what this code produces. This code produces an entirely blank page. Not surprisingly, we don't have anything in the body. So what am I going to talk about? Well, the first most important thing that we have to understand about CSS is the box model. I've said that word a couple times already. What the box model is, is it's those are the rules that the browser follows to position elements on the page. So what is a box? Well, actually everything in CSS is a or HTML is a box. Let's put in a paragraph tag and I'm going to say hello world and I'm going to come back here and I'm going to hit a five. We have a box. How do we know it's a box? Well, I can right click on this, hit inspect element. And if I hover over this P tag, we see that we get this highlight. Um, you see the, the blue highlight and the orange highlight. That is, those are the boundaries of the box of the P tag. Now, a P tag is what's called a block level element. And block level element means that it has its own box and it is positioned always on a new line. For example, if I were to add another P tag and say, whoa, and bring back the browser, or, oh, come on, you can do this to me. We now have two boxes. We have hello world and we have whoa. So that's cool. What's an example of a non-block level element? Well, an example of a non-block ele level element could be the del element. So notice how I now have hello and then world is, has a strike through, but notice how world appears on the same line as hello. It's inside the same box. That's because del is an inline element. So we have two kinds of elements here. We have block level elements and inline elements. I'm not going to be talking much about inline elements. They're, they're straightforward in that they you can think of them as things that can appear within text and not cause a new line to happen. We're going to be talking mostly about block level elements because block level elements make boxes. And boxes are going to be the most important thing to understand about layout and positioning with the box model. So again, just to reiterate, we have two elements here. We know we have two elements here because the first bit right here, the text I have highlighted, is wrapped inside of two p tags, an opening p tag and a closed p tag. We know that this is in its own p tag or p element because it appears within two other p tags, one closing and one opening. So we have two elements. So let's talk about block level elements and let's talk about the different attributes that we have with block level elements because there are three very, very important things we have to understand. Let's create a UL. Four items. Okay, so what do we have here? We have a UL and the UL is an unordered list. And an unordered list is basically a list that doesn't have any order, which is redundant because that's what it's named. It, that's what it's named. Um, and we know it's not ordered because those are just little dots that don't actually have numbers associated with them. This element, this UL element, is a block level element. And so are these little LI guys in here. So let's select one of these LI guys and check out the three 
the, the big three, the big three properties that you need to understand and memorize in order to work with the box model. So to uniquely select one of these LI elements, I'm going to add a class to it. Yes, I could use some fancy CSS to make it so I don't have to add the class to it, but I'm going to add a class called special to it just to make, make my selector simple because this isn't a lesson about selectors. So I'm, one of my LI elements I'm going to give the class of special, which means in my CSS file I can select the element with dot special. Remember, dot special is a class selector that will select any element that has a class of special, which in this document there's only one, this LI that appears here on line 12. Okay, so every box has three things. We have margin, padding, and a border. Come back here and refresh. Look what I did. Every element size is computed by its width, its height, the padding, the margin, and the border. By default. There's ways to override that behavior, but by default, everything, every block level element has padding, margin, and border, and the width of the content. So let's start off simply. What's the width of this content? Well, the width of this content is going to be um, take up the entire page. It's not technically width of 100%. It's a width of what's called auto. Auto means that it'll take up as much space as it can. If we look at using our developer tools and we look at our metrics tab, we can see a visual representation of how the size of the box is calculated by the browser. And as I hover over each one of these bits, we can see it highlighted. So let's go over each one. The first one is we have the width and the height of the content. So you see the width and the height of the content is 860 or 846 by 20. This is calculated by the browser because I've done nothing special to change the width and height of the content. You can do stuff special to change that, but by default, it'll just take up however much width it needs, and then it'll take up however much, or sorry, however much height it needs, and then it can take up the however much width that it has left over on that line. So, um, yes, this will always appear in, as pixels inside the developer tools. I've never, maybe there's a way to get it to do something else, but we haven't talked about other kinds of units yet. We've only been working with pixels. Um, I don't want to talk about other units quite yet. Um, so we have the width of the content, and you can see it highlighted up here. You notice up here the, the content gets highlighted. That's the width and height of the content. Then it's wrapped by the padding. The padding of an element is the, te is the amount of space between the border and the content, which also includes the background. In fact, if I wanted to, I can come back here. I know we haven't talked about the background property yet, but I can explain it very simply. The background color property sets the color of the background. I'm going to set it to a nice little gray. Now I'm going to come back here and refresh. So we see that by increasing the padding of our element, our background grows because there's more space in between the border and the content. And I can prove that by jumping into my styles, looking at my padding attribute, and I can start increasing my padding or decreasing my padding. Right now what I'm doing is I'm using my uh, mouse wheel to move this up and down. Again, if you need a refresher on these development tools, um, check out last week. We did we talked about them then, um, them there because uh, we will be making heavy use of the developing development tools to describe the box model. So as you notice, as I increase and decrease the padding, the size of the box increases in all dimensions. So that's cool. So I'm going to bring the padding down to 30 and jump back down to my metrics. And you see that the padding now has 30 in all directions, top, right, bottom, and left. Then we have our border. Every element has a can have a border. Every box block level element. And in this case, we have a border of one pixels. Now, the actual uh, definition of the actual um, 
the way the style is formatted isn't particularly relevant, but I can read through it really quickly. What we're saying here is we want this element to have a one pixel solid black border. If I were to increase the size of the border, notice what happens. The border gets bigger. But as the border gets bigger, it pushes the content further in. Remember, that's because the border actually impacts the size of the box. Because the border is a very important aspect to the box model. So if I jump back down to my metrics tab, we can see that we have a content width, which notice how the content width actually got smaller. That's because all these other things got larger and the width is only going to be so big as to take up all the space that it has left to take up. So because I've been increasing the, the right padding and the right border, the width have, has less space to take up, so the width has to get smaller, and the browser does that for you automatically. So again, we have the size of the content, the padding, which is the, the space between the content and the border. We have the border, which will always appear outside of my background and on top of my background. Then we have the margin. Now the margin is going to be the space outside of the border, but the space that's between other elements. So increasing or decreasing the margin will actually change the position of the element on the page. I can prove that by going up here and playing with my margin property. I can bring my margin property down, and I can bring my margin property up. Notice how as I modify the margin property, our box gets further away from all the other elements on the page, including the right edge of the browser screen. So notice how when I increase my margin, we go further away from everything. So I really encourage people to play around with the margins and paddings and border, because these are the three things that will significantly change the way a particular box is laid out. There's one more thing I want to talk about margin and padding in particular. And what we see right here is an example of setting every single margin to 10 and every single padding to 10. You might be going, well, what do I mean by every single margin? Isn't there only one? Well, the answer is that, is that there actually are four. Because every box has four sides to it. Which means there's a margin left, a margin right, a margin top, and a margin bottom. Same with padding, and actually same with border. But the border syntax gets a little funky and I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. So. If I wanted to, for example, just affect the left padding of my special element, what I could do is I could type in padding dash left and say 10 pixels. What this will do is, as you see right here, our content is now completely snug with our border in the y-axis, but it's pushed over to the right a little bit because of the padding left. I applied the left padding to it, and we can see that visually represented here as I hover over this item, because there's that little green bit right there. That's Chrome telling me this element has some left padding. Now we can apply as many of these as we want. We can go padding left 10, maybe we want a padding top of 20, and maybe we want a margin right of 200 pixels. So now what we have is a padding top of 20, so it's pushed down by 20 pixels, a padding left of 10, which means it's pushed right by 10 pixels, and then a margin right of 200 pixels. That means that we see in that little orange square right there that, the, that Chrome is presenting to me, the content in its entirety is being pushed over from the right by 200 pixels. These rules are going to work using the same uh, rules, wow, that was a bit redundant. <laughs> These properties use the same rules as every other property for overwriting, meaning any, any style that has a higher precedence than another style will override those specific properties, but you have to be careful. So watch this. Um, I have a special, and then I'll have a special dash override. So I have two classes on this one element, special and special override. I'm going to give the special override higher precedence. And I do that by combining it with another selector. 
I'm saying I want every single special override that's within the HTML element. Well, guess what? Everything's within the HTML element. The only reason I'm putting HTML right here, you might think, wow, that looks really redundant. Why would you add a selector that will select everything anyway? Well, the answer is, is by doing this, I've given every single rule inside of the selector higher precedence. So every single thing inside of special override will override every single rule inside of special. So let's say in special override we decide that we want a margin left of 10 pixels. Now I come back here, notice how that margin left is applied. Remember, if I click on this element, I can have Chrome tell me exactly what styles were applied to this element. We see it under the matched CSS rules. We see that special override has higher precedence than special because it appears first. And then we see that in special override, we are setting the margin left to 10. We're setting that element, or that attribute, or the property, in isolation to every other margin. We're only affecting the left margin here. Now, I could affect every margin if I wanted to. I could say, what if I just said margin 10 pixels? What's going to happen then? Well, margin 10 pixels will override every margin, the top, right, left, and bottom margin, to be 10 pixels. Notice how we know it's override, overridden by Chrome. Chrome puts a little strike through, through our guy right here. A funny story, in um, these developer tools are actually written in HTML and CSS, and they're very similar to the developer tools that's available in Safari. But the funny thing about Safari is with Safari you can inspect the inspector, which I find hilarious. So I could actually inspect the HTML that the select this inspector is using. And yeah, you can just keep on doing that ad nauseum. But anyway, so we know that that margin right is being overridden because it's as a strike through. So that's very, very important to understand about how overriding works, especially with margins and paddings, because if you do a margin colon 10 pixels, you are overriding every margin. See, if I, I can even expand this and it says margin top 10, right 10, bottom 10, left 10. Let's talk about one more bit of syntax that I'm going to be using with the margin and padding. I'm going to go ahead and remove the special override class, because we're not going to need it anymore. And I'm going to keep the border and the background color, but I'm going to remove the padding and the margin. The reason I'm keeping the border and the background color is that when you're learning the box model, having a border and a background makes it very visually distinct as to the boundaries of a particular box. So the last bit of syntax I wanted to use, because I use this very, very, very often, and that is something like, um, let's do 5 pixels, 10 pixels. And I refresh. So what am I doing? I have defined the, the padding as 5 pixels and 10 pixels. But what happens is, is if I expand this, look what, look what the browser actually does. The top and bottom of the padding will be 5 pixels, and the left and right of the padding will be 10 pixels. So it allows us to um, it allows us to specify four properties with a very convenient syntax with providing a different padding value for the top and bottom and a different padding value for the left and right. So notice how when I increase the first one, it gets more padding in top and bottom, and when I increase the second one, it gets more padding in left and right. It doesn't actually stop there. I could do 1px, 2px, 3px, 4px, and specify them all on the same line. I don't use this syntax very often, I'll be honest. Um, it is a nice little shorthand, but I, A, I don't find myself doing this very often, and B, it looks kind of ugly. But, I mean, if you, I'm just showing this here for the sake of completion. Top gets applied first, then right, then bottom, then left. So it's just a shorthand, but I don't use this shorthand very often. Okay, so we've talked about increasing our margin, padding, and border. And those are the three things that will affect the size of a box. Before I move on to um, 
one of the most counterintuitive things about CSS. I want to take a quick second and talk about colors. So this should be this should be a nice little calm before the storm. Um, in CSS, there are two main ways to specify, well, three main ways to specify colors. We can specify them by name, such as black, if we wanted to. Um, black is one of the built-in CSS names. There are many of them. You can look them up in a reference somewhere. I don't really use them very often. Um, or you can specify them in hex. What I have here is actually a shorthand of the hex syntax. And um, hexadecimal is a base 16 numbering system. When I say base 16, I mean that the numbers go from 0 to F. You know how decimal is a base 10 system, so it goes from 0 to 9 before you get a new place value? So you go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Well, hex goes 0, 1, 2, bleh. wow, I can't even count. Huh. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 1 A, 1 B, 1 C, 1 D, 1 F, and so on. Those are called nibbles, actually. Funny story. And a nibble is always going to be half a byte, which I think is funny too. Anyway, so in this syntax, we have three nibbles, and each one of these nibbles represents one of the color channels. First one is red. Second one is green, and the third one is blue. So if I set the first nibble to F, that would mean that this box, or eh, I'll, I'll play around with the background color instead of the border, because it'll be easier to see. So if I change this to F00, zero, zero, <laughs> foo, notice how it turns red. It turns red because we're setting the red channel to F, and F is the largest um, hexadecimal digit. We could do F, A, B if we wanted to. I don't know what this is going to look like. Eh, it's kind of like this weird little color. But the point is, is we have F for the R channel, A for the green channel, and B for the... or You know what I'm saying. There's one more way to um, specify hexadecimal colors. Actually, there's two, but I'm not going to worry about the second one or the third one. The second one is to provide six nibbles. So I could do 0, 0, F, F, A, A, if I wanted to. If you provide six nibbles, then two nibbles are used for each channel, which allows you to specify, have more control over how much, um, how much color you put in. So in this case, we have zero for, the, for red. Remember, these are two nibbles, and they turn into one byte, and zero, zero, the hexadecimal number zero, zero turns into zero. Then we have F, F, which turns into 255, and then AA, which turns into something I forgot. But the point is, is that this is the red channel, green channel, or red, blue, green. I hope I'm not confusing myself saying all this stuff over and over again. Red, green, blue. There we go. Thank you, NATO. Wow, I'm terrible at this game, aren't I? Okay, the next way to talk about or to do um, colors is the RGB and RGBA. So RGB is you put in the word RGB, then open up parentheses, and then you can specify the numbers as decimal into the system. So this will have a red channel of 0, a green channel of uh, 255, and a blue channel of 20. And it turns into this weird green thing. The last one that I want to talk about is the RGBA. RGBA has been introduced in CSS fairly recently, and RGBA allows you to pass in one more channel. That channel is the opacity, or the alpha channel. The opacity of, or the alpha channel of an RGBA color ranges from 0 to be completely transparent to 1 to being completely opaque. So I can put in 0.25 if I wanted to. And what that's going to do is that's going to make my background mostly transparent. In fact, if I come up here and move, well, that's not going to work, right? So if I move this to point 0.2, we get that. If I move this to point 0.7, it's less transparent. If I go to 9, it's almost completely opaque. And if I go to 1, it's fully opaque. 
So in this class, you'll be, you'll be seeing me do mostly um, three nibble colors, six nibble colors, and RGBA is primarily what I use. Okay, so I just wanted to s sidestep about that. Uh, it's fun stuff. It's it's it, it's that's there's no like logic to learn about how colors work. You just have to kind of memorize. Okay, we have these handful of ways to specify colors. And at that point, you can just play around with it to your heart's content. Okay, so let's talk about something that is not intuitive about CSS. I'm going to select every single li element on this page. Remember, if I go back to my document structure, we have these four LIs. I want to select all of them. What I'm going to do to them is I'm going to give them all a margin of 10 pixels up and down and 0 pixels left and right. So this will give it a margin top and a margin bottom of 10, and a margin left and a margin right of 0. Can anybody tell me how much space is going to be in between each LI? Don't worry if you can't answer this, but I want people to guess. How much total space is going to be in between each LI, given that each LI has a margin top and a margin bottom of 20, or 10? OK, so people said 20. I was expecting them to say that, but that's actually not true. This is one of the most um, counterintuitive things about CSS, which will get you. So I just want to point it out. This is just one of the pitfalls that you'll run into. It's something called margin collapsing. If there are two block level elements nested right next to each other, and they both have a margin that will conflict, those margins gets, gets, get collapsed into the largest margin. As a result, the total space between each LI is actually 10 pixels because 10 pixels is the largest margin between them. Notice how I move up and down up here on my elements select my elements uh, page or tab, and we see our margins represented there in orange. As I move up and down them, notice how this LI has that much margin down there at the bottom, but this LI has a margin that actually goes into the previous elements margin. Well, that's an example of a margin collapse. I just wanted to point that out. If you're running into a margin, uh, an issue with your margins, then remember that there is such a thing as margin collapse and it will annoy you. <laughs> but I just wanted to point that out. Anyway, so oh, uh, one more quick point about margin collapsing. Um, margin collapsing only works on vertical margins. It doesn't work on horizontal margins. But this is something that's, this is not a bug in the browser. This is in the spec of HTML and CSS. That's how it works. OK, so let's talk about the width property. The width property is lots of fun. The width property allows us to specify the width of the content of an element. So let's talk about, I'm going to go ahead and put in two paragraphs. I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use two paragraphs for this example. And I'm going to put in some lorem ipsum, in, ipsum into them. If you haven't heard of lorem ipsum, lorem ipsum is a um, just a bunch of dummy text that designers use to throw text onto the screen. I'm going to give this peak element a class of special. I like that name because it doesn't mean anything. Um, yes, lorem ipsum is uh, Latin. And yes, I was able, in Sublime Text, you just type in lorem and t hit tab, and it prints out lorem ipsum. Alternatively, you can go online and find a lorem ipsum generator. Anyway, so what we have here are two paragraphs. And if we look at their size, they're both sized using something called size of auto. Also notice the margin collapse. Again, there's another example of margin collapse. But anyway, um, a width of auto, so if I go back to my CSS and select on the special, t special p tag, a width of auto is the default. And auto will simply take up as much space as the content can. It's typically what you want 90% of the time. But that's not the most interesting thing we can do with uh, width. We can go ahead and give width 
or that's going to be ugly. Uh, we can go ahead, get ahead and give it with a fixed pixel size. So if I go back and refresh, notice how the width of the second paragraph has now become smaller. I know that that seems fairly straightforward. You know, we give the we give the element a spe specific pixel width, and that's what it does. But you have to be cognizant of the uh, padding and the margin and the border, because the width only applies to the content by default. By default, specifying a width of 200 pixels will make the content 200 pixels. But if I were to go down here and say, okay, well, let's do a width of 200 and a padding of 10 pixels. And then let's give it a border of five pixels solid, um, how about red? Come back here and refresh. The width is still, the width of the element or the content is still 200. We see it's 200 down here because we're looking at our metrics tab and we see the content is, is sized to 200 pixels. But then the padding, the border, and the margin is added to that original size. Which means, if I was to hover over the P tag, notice how up there it says P dot special 230 pixels by 330 pixels? Well, that's because the padding of 10 pixels and the border of 5 pixels that I gave it actually increased the size of the element, because the width that I specified only affects the content. So what we get is because this padding has a padding top and a padding bottom, or sorry, a padding left and a padding right of 10, that's 20, and then we have a border with a border left and a border right of 5, so that's another 10. We get 30 additional pixels, which gives us the 230 amount that you see up there in the tooltip. So <clears throat> that is the width property. Most of the time, you'll be specifying widths in pixels and percentages. So what do I mean by percentages? Well, pretty much every numeric value in CSS can be specified with a percent. And that percent is going to have, or is going to take up as much space as the parent attribute by that percent. Wow, I did, that was, that was confusing even hearing me. Um, <laughs> that was even confusing hearing it come out of my own mouth. So let me go ahead and demonstrate that. I'm gonna create a div with a class of container. And I'm gonna wrap my special p tag inside of it. I'm going to give my container a width of 500 pixels. And then I'm gonna give my the width of special to be 25 pixels. If I come back here, look at what just happened. If I hover over container, we see that the container is 500 pixels wide. We can see that both in the tooltip right there and in the little guy down here, our little metrics tab. Now if I open up my div right here and go into special, Notice how the special is now, its content is sized to 125, which happens to be a quarter of 500. So the width is being, it, like I said, it's being applied to the parent box's width. So that's very important to understand. However, remember that because we've given this special box a width of 25%, that means its content is going to be 25%, meaning that the padding, the border, and the margin still affect its size, which is not ideal. We will be coming back to um, how that isn't ideal when we try to style our little guys up here. There's a way around it too, of course, because CSS is awesome like that. Okay, so we, we've talked about percent widths, uh, fixed widths. We've talked about how margins, paddings, and borders all affect the size of a box. Those are some of the most important aspects of CSS to understand. So now that we've talked about some, you know, sort of acad uh, academic stuff, let's go ahead and get into actually building out the first part of our application. And that's going to be the top bar. I want to do the top bar. I don't want to worry about the navigation yet. And I want to do the footer. I want to bring all these things and style them for us. So let's go ahead and do that. 
I'm going to clear out my style sheet and I'm going to clear out pretty much the majority of my body because we're going to be replacing that with our own code. Let's start off with the header. Header seems like a good place to start off with because I wanted to make a header. And because I wanted to make a header, I'm going to use the header tag. There's no special magical reason why I decided to put a header tag here other than I wanted a header. Next up, I'm going to open up a div and I'm going to give it a class of width container. We'll see why that's needed here very shortly. Next up, I'm going to put in an h1 tag of to do application. Then I'm going to finish this off with a footer. And then inside of the footer, I'm just going to put my awesome copyright notice because this is super top secret code that I don't want anybody copying. Actually, that's the exact opposite of what I want people to do, but still. And I'll give the footer a class of width container. And again, we will be talking about that very shortly. What do we have so far? Well, we have an application with an H1 and a footer, and that's it. But we want it to look like this. So what's the first step? Well, the first step is going to be to get the header centered into our page, as well as the footer. Notice how this is centered. Well, it's actually very easy to do this. This is trick number one that I expect everybody to memorize right now. If I want these elements to be centered on my page with a fixed width, all you need to do is give an element a fixed width and a margin of auto. So let's talk about that. Let's style my width container. Remember how I created this arbitrary div and I've given it the class of width container. I've done that for both, both my div or my header and my footer. Well, I'm going to go to my width container and I'm going to give it a width, this page, a width of 800 pixels. If I go back and hit a five, there's absolutely no difference as to how the page looks yet. Because now when I come in and say margin auto, watch what happens. We now have a centered application. The margin auto will center any element that has a fixed width. So I definitely want people to memorize that particular trick because that will be used a lot. I'm not so happy with the fixed width though right here because I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of people asking out here, well, we're talking about modern web design. <clears throat> the whole premise of this class is that we're talking about the latest features and the latest techniques that you should use when working with web design. And one of those things that has, has really been discouraged is the concept of a container that has a fixed width. One of the ways that we can fix this is using, instead of the width property, we can use the max width property and the min width property. So if I do max width of 800, and min width of, let's say, 600. Uh, let's do a max width of 900. I don't know, I'm just pulling these numbers out. And hit a 5. Now what we'll see is the application will stop getting larger when we get to that max width. But as we go inside of it, we don't see a scroll bar at the bottom of the page until we get past that min width. So notice how the scroll bar is now coming into play? It's only coming into play once we get past the min width. You should always, if you're working with some sort of, or if you're wanting to have your application be modern, um, having fluid widths like this is very important. Now, we can of course go even further than this and introduce responsive design, but we're going to be doing that next week. This is just a sort of precursor to what we're going to be talking about, to how we can get our, our designs to work on mobiles mobile devices just as they do on desktops. Okay, so I have my width container and my width container is being applied to my header and my footer. You might be asking yourself, well, why did you put the div there? Why, why didn't you just tell the header to have these widths on them in a margin of auto? Well, the answer to that actually is that I want the header to have a background that actually goes on the entire, goes or is appears for the entire width of the application. This is also a very, very common design pattern that's used in web design. So let's do that. 
what I can do is I can just style my header. So I'm going to go ahead and say header background. We're going to just use, use a background of a very, very dark gray for now. And I hit a five and look what happens. But that really isn't very close to this. In fact, it looks pretty awful. So let's start off with styling our header first and our fonts to get it to match the look of this. And then we'll get our positioning correct to where this is snug up against the edge of the page. So let's do our fonts first, because we talked about fonts before. Well, the way I styled this particular H1, I'm going to go ahead and select it by saying header H1. Remember, I'm going to have other H1 tags on this page. So I need to tell it, tell CSS that I only want to style the H1 that's underneath the header element. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a color of white. And what else should we do? Um, let's give it a font size of 12 points and leave it at that. Next up, I'm going to style my body up here. My body is going to have a margin of zero pixels and a padding of zero. Whoops, I didn't want to do that yet. I wanted to give it a font family of Arial. There we go. <laughs> I also want to get my, um, now nah, that should be fine for now. So it's a lot closer. We now have our to-do application and our font is being styled fairly appropriately. Pretty close to what we have before. But we have a problem. We have some ugly margins. And these margins are being caused in part by the H1 and also by the body. And in some browsers, the HTML element, depending on what browser you have. Notice how I hover, hover over body. Look at that pat, that margin. If I go down to metrics, no, it's not going to show, uh, there we go. The body has a margin of eight pixels. We don't want that. We want our header to be snug up against the edge of our screen. So let's go ahead and fix that. I'm going to write a selector that'll select the HTML element and the body element. And I'm going to give it a padding of zero pixels and a margin of zero pixels. This will make everything within my page fit snug up against the edge of my application. But not quite, we're not quite there yet though. Because if I go back into my header and my div and look at my H1, my H1 also has a margin given to us by default by the browser. So we're going to have to get rid of that margin if we want our background to appear appropriately. So let's go ahead and do that. Inside of my header H1, I'm going to give it a margin of zero pixels and a padding of 10 pixels. Then I'm going to come back here and hit a five. Now we're getting somewhere. Now our application looks pretty similar to what we had before. So how's everyone doing? We've gone through, we've gotten rid of our margin and padding on our body element and our H1, HTML element. We've gotten rid of the margin of our H1 element, which allows my header element to be sized appropriately and be fit snug up against the top of the browser. So let's do something fun. Um, if we come back here, you'll notice there's a nice little gradient here that stops right there when we hit to do application. Well, the, the way I actually implemented that was I gave my header h1, or sorry, my width container inside of header. So I went header width container, and I gave it a background of something. I think I gave it a background of 222. So if I come back, we now have a different background for our header. And we can actually now see the entire size of our header element represented visually. But what we're missing is this cool little gradient. So how did I build this gradient? Well, I went on Google and I typed in CSS gradient generator, hit enter, clicked on the first result, ultimate CSS generator. I use this tool all of the time. So this is just a fun little aside that you can do, that you can play with, with CSS3, and that is putting together gradients. And use a tool like this 
and it's very, very easy to put together. Um, I highly do not recommend trying to type any of this code out by hand. I think I ended up clicking on one of the defaults. Um, I click on that one. Yeah, that looks about right. So I clicked on one of the defaults. You can edit this to your heart's content. It's, it's a fun little tool to play with. Then I went down here on CSS, hit copy, went back to the code, and I pasted it. It's important to note where I pasted it into. I pasted it right into the header, and I replaced the background. If I go back to the application and hit refresh, now we have that nice little gradient in the background of our header, which is what we wanted. Um, here, let me go ahead and just paste the link to this page to you guys, because I can't really paste the code into BuzzNet because it's very large. I will want, I do want to point out one thing. This tool is slightly outdated. The reason I say that is because these vendor prefixes are actually on their way out. And what I want to do here is I want to keep in the IE10 one and the W3C one, but I want to remove the Firefox, the WebKit, and the other WebKit, and I'll keep in the Opera, I believe. The reason for that is that our, the, uh, the vendor-specific prefixes for gradients and for everything else are on their way out. And Firefox and Chrome, uh, because they both auto-update, I don't worry about supporting older versions of either of those browsers. And the current versions, they work with this code. This is the code that you're supposed to be writing, but every single browser vendor decided to throw in their own unique version of it. Okay, so that's kind of fun. I just wanted to point that out, that you can do some cool stuff with that. Um, it's not particularly super important, but it's fun to play with and gives you some cool styles. So the next thing I want to do is I want to style my footer. See my footer down there? It's small and it's gray. Well, guess what? That's really easy to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into example. I'm going to grab this footer element. I'm going to go down here and do footer. Uh, what did I give it? I gave it, I gave it something. I think I gave it a font size of eight points and a color of dark or light gray. And then I came back here and hey, look, our footer is now being styled. Okay, so we have an example of our first use of some very important block level elements to give our page a very distinct visual style. The next thing that I want to talk, I want to do, is I want to blow everybody's minds. <laughs> what we're looking at right here with this sidebar is possibly one of the most common things that you will be asked to do as a web designer or a web developer. Here's the bad news. Doing columns like this is not trivial, and it's not something that is going to be the same for every problem that you try to solve. What I'm going to show is the most common way to solve this problem, but it is far from the only way to solve this problem. So let's talk a little bit about floats. So floats allow us to make content go either to the right or to the left of other content. So let's say I came down here into my example too, and let's say I typed in, I want to go ahead and type out that HTML that I wrote uh, before. I entered in a width container. Then I created um, a, well, we'll not worry about that quite yet. I want to worry about two sections, one called author. and one called news. Author is going to have an H1, whoops, H1 with a span of about with Nelson McKay. And then I'm going to put in the P tag and I'm gonna dump in some lorem ipsum. And then on my news, I'm going to write articles. 
each article is going to be a combination of an H1 and one to many P tags, which I'm just going to have lorem ipsum. I'm now going to copy and paste this article a few times just to give me some dummy text to play with. So some news, other news, whoa, and stuff, doesn't matter. They're just news articles, basically. And all I wanted to do here was get the structure of my document in place. So if you wanted to go ahead and just take a look at um, our structure, we have two sections, one with a class of author, one with a class of news. And each section has H1 tags and P tags within it, and all that fun stuff. If I go back to my page, we get this. Unfortunately, this isn't very close to what, what we want to have happen. What we want to have happen is, is we want the about to be floated over to the right. Well, what we can do is I can go into my style sheet and I can say, let's say section dot author. Remember, this means I want to find a section element with the class name of author, which will match this element right here and only this element so far. And I want him to have a, a, a fixed width. I want to give him a fixed width of something. Um, now I could give him a fixed width in terms of percentages, and that's typically what you would want to do, but <laughs> unfortunately things get a little bit complex with that. We'll be definitely, that'll be the focus of next week when we talk about responsive design. So I give him a fixed width of 250. That's not all we need to do, because that just fixes his this, the width of this block to that size. It's not very good. <laughs> what we also need to do is we need to shoot this element off to the right hand side of my page. Well, we can do that with a float of right. If I come back here and hit F5, notice how I just shot this guy all the way to the right hand side of the page, which is pretty cool. But we have more problems. Now, the biggest problem that we can see here is that what's happening with our news articles is they're wrapping around this floated element. See, if I was to inspect this, we can click on this, and we can see the box that's taken up by this block. And this block is being wrapped around by the other content. And that's not desirable, typically. It's usually desirable for things like images or other things that you want to wrap. But this looks ugly compared to this. So what can we do? Well, let's go ahead and give our news section a margin. I'm going to give it a margin right of 260 pixels. By giving it a margin right of 260 pixels, the content, all of the content in news is going to be pushed over from the right by 260. Why did I give it 260? Well, we know the width of the sidebar is 250 pixels, but I also wanted to have 10 pixels in between this box and the box next to it. We can see an example of that by looking at um, our inspector and seeing that our news section is actually being pushed over by 260 pixels, whereas our, auth whereas our author section has only a width of 250 pixels. So that's the basic positioning of this, but we have a problem. Let's imagine that I'm going to go ahead and make it so there's only one article. I should have probably started off with one article, so don't hate me too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment out all of this HTML so it's not even rendered by the browser anymore. And I'm going to come back to the page, I'm going to hit, hit F5, and we'll see something that isn't desirable. Can anybody see the thing that is definitely not desirable about this? Yep, it's the footer location. What we see here is our width container is not actually constrained or is not constrained to the size of floated elements. Floated elements do not by default cause the container element to grow in that direction. In fact, 
if I was to go into my news section and right click on this and say delete node, guess what? My width container right here has a height of zero pixels, even though it has a section class author inside of it that has a height of 250 pixels. It's because the width container doesn't use floated elements to calculate its height, which this is the biggest problem that you will run into with floating. It's a big problem and it's frustrating and it's annoying and there are many solutions to it and they all suck. I'm, I'm seriously not even kidding right now. Let's talk about how we can fix this. Well, the first most common approach to fixing this problem is with the magical and mysterious overflow hidden. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap my author and news into another element. The reason I'm going to wrap it in another element is so that I don't have to muck up the definition of width container when I start messing around with making this work the way I want it to. So I'm going to write a div and I'm going to give it a class of site info container. Then I'm going to indent everything within it and I'm going to close write in a closing tag so that everything is wrapped inside of this site info container. That just gives me another element to add properties into. So I can demonstrate the three ridiculously nasty and disgusting hacks to get this to work. Let's start with the easiest. Easiest one is overflow hidden. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into site info container and I'm going to add a, a CSS rule and I'm going to select on it using the class selector. I'm going to say overflow hidden. What do you guys think overflow hidden actually does? First of all, before I show this. It doesn't move anything. Um, overflow hidden will chop off all of the overflow of an element. Meaning that if I were to constrain an element to be 20 pixels by 20 pixels and I gave it overflow hidden, everything will be chopped off that doesn't fit within those 20 pixels. But it has a side effect. It has a very interesting side effect that I have no idea how that this aspect ever got into the CSS specification. And it has a side effect that has absolutely nothing to do with overflowing or hiding anything. And that is, it'll fix our problem. I'm not kidding. Um, by applying overflow hidden to a parent element, you are entering, I believe the, the terminology used in the specification is called a, a float context or something. Uh, I should probably have reread that bit before class, but there's a terminology for what overflow hidden does, and it starts a new container, you, I guess you could say, that contains floats. And what it will cause is it'll cause the parent element to have the a height that will equal all of the height of its children, including floated elements. So how's everyone feeling about overflow hidden? <laughs> nah. Yes, it's very odd, and it works. You, you can use it. I use it. It's not fun. But there's another way to do this. Um, and that is with clearing. If I were to go down here, so notice how this div site info container starts right here and it ends down here. I'm going to add an element. It's an empty div and I'm going to give it a forced style of clear both. What does this style attribute do? The style attribute just makes whatever CSS appears within the, the quotes be forced upon the element. You should always use style sheets instead, but this example is so straightforward or simple that we're only adding one attribute to it. So I want to give clear both to that, and I'm going to jump back down here, and I'm going to remove the overflow hidden. I'm going to go back here, and I'm going to refresh. It also works. So what's going on here? We have an empty element with the style of clear both. Clear both will cause this element to be pushed 
all the way down until it clears anything that's floating. You actually have three things you can pass into clear, or well, four. You can pass in none. None will clear nothing. Notice how the footer jumped all the way back up to the top of the page. We can pass in left. Left will clear anything that's floated to the left, which it's still not in the right position because what we're caring about is the thing that's floated to the right. We have right, which will work because by doing clear right, it'll jump the footer all the way down past the extent of this floated element. Or we have both, and both will clear both left and right. So that's wonderfully obnoxious, and I hate it. So, I don't like this because it requires that I add additional markup to my page, which I shouldn't do. Which is why I, I, I use Overflow Hidden a lot. But Overflow Hidden isn't perfect, because imagine that I had a, a pop-up that was nested inside of my site info container. Guess what? That pop-up isn't going to be able to appear outside of the container because the overflow is being chopped off. So this isn't a good thing. Another thing about clear both is using clears is it's not it's, it lacks any semantic meaning whatsoever. It's just gross. I hate it. It's dumb. But sometimes it's your only option, which is why I'm showing all three options of fixing this floating problem. So now I'm going to go back. I'm going to remove my overflow hidden again, which I just put in a second ago for no reason. Um, I probably shouldn't have because now everyone's probably confused. Jump back here. So we have a problem. There's one more solution to this problem that isn't perfect either, but it works. Let's talk about it. It's called the clear fix. The clear fix is a combination of a variety of different browser-specific hacks that will cause the browser to enter in a new flow context without hiding the overflow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a class selector called ClearFix. <laughs> okay, this is wonderful. And by the way, this version of the ClearFix, uh, there's two main versions of ClearFix. This is a very, very well-documented hack um, that you will see everywhere. Um, there's two versions of it. One version, uh, the one I'm going to show you, won't work on anything less than Internet Explorer 9, I believe, but I don't care about anything less than Internet Explorer 9, and this is a modern HTML and CSS for designers and developers class. Um, if you want to find the version that also works on Internet Explorer 6, for example, it's out there on the internet. Anyway, so what does this look like? Well, it's pretty... disgusting. But it works. So what I just did, don't worry about the the colon after or the content or the display table. That's irrelevant. The important thing of what I just did is I created a new class selector called ClearFix, which means that I can now go in and apply this class selector to anything that I want to fix the clear on. For example, I want site info container to stretch to the entire size of its floated elements. So now I can do that by adding in another class called ClearFix. And when I come back down here, now it works. Our ClearFix class is now forcing the size of our, or the height of our site info container to contain all of the floats within it. I honestly don't expect this to make any sense to people. <laughs> well, I expect the the the, exp the high level explanation to, but not the specifics. Uh, ClearFix is simply a very well documented hack, and we have to use it for what we're doing with this class. And you will have to use it when you work with your own designs. Typically, I will use Overflow Hidden or the ClearFix. Very rarely do I find myself in a position where I need to use the Clear both. So now that I'm done like showing you that problem, I can go ahead and remove my comments here so that we'll have an example of my page with three articles in it. <laughs> 
And of course, I have to actually save the HTML file for that to appear. OK, so let's wrap up styling our um, about and our news, and then we'll go on break. So what did I do here? Well, I did some basic styling. I added, I changed the font size of our headers. I added in some line height into our paragraphs. And I made the about little thing look kind of pretty, I guess you could say. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to start off with giving our um, headers a specific font size. To do that, I'm going to go down to the bottom of my page. And on Site Info Container, I'm going to select Site Info Container H1. That'll select all H1 tags that are inside of my Site Info Container element. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a font size of 12 points. As you see, that normalizes all of my sizes for headers. The next thing I'm going to do is, you guys remember that uh, span I put in the H1 up here? I have a a little inline element right here that has about inside of it inside, inside of a span. I want to go ahead and style this a little bit differently. I want to tone down the font size and give it a different color. Just a little nice little touch for that. So to do that I'll give it a color of 777, a font size of 10 points, and I'm going to give it a text transform of lowercase. What does text transform lowercase do? Well, it changes the casing of every character to be lowercase. So now our about looks kind of pretty. OK, the final thing that I, that I did here is I went in and I changed the line height and the font size of my p tags. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to change the font size of everything that's inside of the site info container. So I'm going to do that with a class selector of site info container. Again, that's going to select this element. Now the great thing about that is I can t go ahead and type in font size and I can give it a font size of how about 10 points. And that's going to tone down the font size of my p tags down here. But still looks kind of ugly. Now in design, if you guys have ever taken a des design course or a typography course in particular, you'll know about line height. And line height is all about adding spacing between the lines of our paragraphs. Very typically, the majority of your application isn't going to have a line height, except for when you want to display blocks of text. And I'm going to show you guys a magic value that if you apply to a paragraph, will make the paragraph instantly more readable. You guys ready for this? I'm going to say site info container P, which means I'm selecting every single P tag inside of site info container. I'm going to give it a line height of 1.6 EM. And now it's a lot more readable. 1.6 EM is actually not an arbitrary value. It's a very common value. I think there's actually um, a few more decimal places that are used in it typically. But I always just use 1.6 EM because my, mem mem my memory sucks. But anyway, it's a very straightforward design-y type thing that you would learn about in a typography course. But it instantly makes any paragraph look nicer. The final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, as we see up here, I want a margin and a border on my element to delineate it from the rest of my application. So let's go ahead into my site info container. And I'm going to give it a border top of two pixels, solid black. I'm going to give it a margin top of 10 pixels. And that looks pretty good. A question did come in about how these two p tags, the one right here and the one over here, are very close together. Remember, we can fix that by playing with the margin right that's applied to our news section. Remember our margin right right here? I can visualize that for you guys by clicking on news, going down to styles, and showing my margin right right here. Watch what happens when I increase it. As I increase it, 
that element gets pushed over more and more to the right. Personally, I like that there's 20, there's 10 pixels in between here, so I'm going to keep it like that. But if you guys want to add more spacing or less spacing, although I highly recommend going any less than 10 pixels, um, then that's how you would do it. I guess the last thing I could show people before we go on break is I really like this background color and this subtle border right here on my header. So let's go ahead and throw those visual elements in. Again, at this point, I'm just tweaking the, the, the aesthetics of the page. And so I'm sitting here like thinking, OK, how can we make this page a little bit more lively? Well, I think giving it a nice little background color on the body would make it a little bit more lively. So let's do that. I'm going to give a background of a light gray. Then on my header, I'm going to give my header a border bottom of two pixels solid white. Now when I come up here, we have a very, very subtle visual element on our header. I don't know if you guys can even see it with the compression, but it makes a big difference in my opinion, as well as a nice darker background. So with those, again, those two really simple little tweaks, we've made the page nicer looking. Okay, so before we go on a break, a quick recap. We talked about basically boxes, because the box model is all about boxes. We talked about the three, the big three with boxes. And the big three are padding, order, and margin. These big three properties will determine the size of an element. We talked about how to constrain the width of a container, and in addition to that, how to get it centered on the page. And we can see an example of that up here at the header. Because not only does the header have a fixed width, well, it doesn't, you know what I mean by fixed width. Like, it's a, actually a scale. It can go in between, between 600 and 900 pixels. But it's also centered on the page, which is very nice. Very nice effect. We talked about uh, gradients. Well, we didn't really talk about gradients. All I basically said is, hey, you can do this. Go to this site and copy and paste what it generates. Because there's no way that I'm ever going to write this manually myself. I mean, seriously, I give props to whoever wrote this tool, because he's awesome. Um, so we talked about gradients. We talked about background colors. Um, or she. Yep. <laughs> he or she who created this page is awesome. Um, we talked about giving our, you know, our H1 a different color, different font size, setting the margin padding to what we want it to, and all that fun stuff. The big thing that we talked about was floating. So we have an example right here of our author being floated to the right. That allows us to create columns inside of our layouts, which is going to be something that you will do a lot of with web design. But we also talked about some of the pitfalls of having floating. And one of those is the zero width or zero height problem. So if I delete the news element, notice how the footer is still pushed down to the bottom. We were able to do that using the clear fix hack. Clearfix hack just made our container have the same or, or constrain itself to the size of everything, including floated elements. We could have used overflow hidden or we could have used a clear, but we didn't. We used a clear fix, which is generally the cleanest of the three methods, although I do sometimes still use overflow hidden. And that's really about it. Um, we talked about setting the background of our body and also some typography tools that we can use. Um, both in how we made the line height look more visually pleasing and how we got this cool little effect out of our span. So after break, we're going to come back and we're going to look at how we can put all of this stuff together to make slightly more complicated examples of layouts. For example, we have our navigation bar up here and we have our little lists down here. So yeah. Okay, and we are back. So let's go ahead and talk about this navigation guy up here. This is going to be the last sort of concept that we're going to talk about today. Um, the last big conceptual thing that is important to understand. And fortunately, this concept is a little bit easier than floating, which is why I left it towards last to um, talk about it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fire up another page. 
to talk about it. Then we'll go back into example. Oops, on a new folder. I want another HTML file. I want example 3.html and I'm going to create another another style sheet. styles3.css. Then I'm going to open them both both up in my editor. And I'm just going to go and copy all of this code into HTML and then I'm going to delete everything but the body. And then I'm going to change the reference to styles3.css. So now if I load up example 3.html, we'll have a completely blank application where we can now talk about the final most important aspect to CSS positioning. And that is positioning. So if I was were to create a div up here, or now let's create a header, why not? And put into h1, whoa and things. And then I'm going to dump a p tag in here with some lorem ipsum. The reason I'm doing this is to, uh, I want some dummy text to increase the size of my header element a little bit. And then I'm going to create a div called example dash one. I'm going to say, this is example one. So if I load that up in my browser, we'll see fairly straightforward rendering of our application. We have our header, our h1 tag, we have our paragraph, and we have this is example one, which is just a little div. In CSS, every single box level element can have a position. And there are four kinds of positions we can use. The first one is the default positioning. And I'm going to explicitly, for the sake of this example, specify it and that is position static. That's going to have zero effect whatsoever on our application because that is the default. Everything is by default positioned statically. Basically what position static means is it means, well, the browser gets to decide where the position is. Um, it could be, um, uh, it, it'll be pushed down by all the other block level elements. So this is what we're used to looking at so far. But there's three more that are a lot of fun to play with. And these three are going to be something that's important to understand for working with positioning elements. The next one, the, I, I, I would argue the easiest one to understand is position relative. Now position relative actually will have zero effect on our element. So let me create another example element. I'm going to take this, I'm going to copy and paste it and change its class to example two and then change its text example to as well so we can visually see the difference. And it'll have absolutely no effect, actually. Position relative technically positions stuff statically, but with one additional thing that we can do. We are now allowed within CSS to take advantage of the top and left properties as well as the right, or just the top and left, yeah. You typically won't be using uh, right and bottom with uh, relative positioning. I'm going to give this a background of green, and I'm going to give example one a background of red. I'm going to do that so that as I move these elements around, the difference will be a little bit more apparent. So if you give it position relative, what you can do is you can now specify the top and the left, or that's typically what you're going to do. If I give this a top of 10 pixels and a left of 5 pixels, what that's going to do is it's going to move it down 10 pixels and it's going to move it to the right by 5 pixels. By specifying at position relative, we can now relatively position the element. However, this is very important to understand. What would happen if I created a div class example 2-1 and I said this is example 2.1 and I gave example 2-1 a background of yellow. What do you think is going to happen when I hit a 5? I just added a new element to my page after my relatively positioned element. Watch this. 
the relatively positioned element is now a, on top of the absolutely positioned element, or of the statically positioned element. If I were to go into my inspector and play around with my top and left, and yes, you can do negative uh, tops as well, notice how we're changing where the element is positioned, but we're not affecting the other elements and how they're positioned. So the position relative allows us to move our element around, but the space that it would have taken up if it was positioned statically is unaffected. So there's still that empty space right there in between example 1 and example 2.1, no matter where we move this element. So that's relative positioning. There's two more. I'm going to create a example three. And an example three dot one. I'm going to give example three one or okay, let's give example three a background of purple and an example three dot one a background of blue and nothing else. Which means if I go back to my page, we now have a purple purple element right here and a blue element right here. The important thing to note about how this is with static positioning is that this purple element is actually pushing this blue element down. But we can actually change the behavior of that. And that brings us into the third position attribute. That is position absolute. Just by giving an element a position absolute and going back to my page and refreshing it, we'll notice an immediate difference. Well, notice quite a few differences, actually. The first difference is by giving example three a position of absolute, it no longer pushes my example 3.1 down. You'll also notice that its width is now, it's the, the size of the box is now literally just the content size. It's no longer going to fill up all the space it can take. The next thing to note is that it's actually appearing right on top of where it would have been positioned if it was not positioned absolutely. But typically, you would do more than this. Because with position absolute, we have four other properties we can use in conjunction with it. The first two we've already seen, top and left. If I gave this a position absolute with a top of 10 and a left of 5, just like how I gave this example to a top of left and, a, and a, a top of left, really, a top of 10 and a left of 5, and come back here and refresh, look at that. Not only was this element removed from the flow of the document, it now allows me to position it absolutely anywhere on my page. But like I said, there's actually two more properties we can use in addition to top and left. We can also use their inverse. I can go ahead and say right of 10 and bottom of 10. And what this is going to do is this is going to cause my, my absolutely positioned element to appear 10 pixels offsetted from the bottom right hand side of the page. You guys see that? So absolute positioning allows us to do all that fun stuff. But there's one thing that you guys absolutely must understand about absolute positioning. Very commonly, I see the mistake of people saying that absolute positioning allows you to position anything on the page. That is actually not true. Absolute positioning allows you to position anything relative to the first thing that is positioned relatively. And I know that's confusing, so let me throw up an example. I'm going to create a div. I'm going to call it 
class equals container. And I'm going to dump some lorem into it. Then I'm going to go into my container class and I'm going to give it a width of 300 pixels and a height of 300 pixels. And I'm going to give it a background of dark gray and I'm going to give it a color of white. So there's our div right there, right? I gave it a fixed width and I gave it a fixed height. It is positioned statically. Then I'm going to, inside of my div, I'm first going to, in order to make this actually compliant, I'm going to wrap this in a p tag, just for fun. I'm going to place another div with the class of example four. Now, example four, I'm going to give it a color of red or a background of red. I'm going to give it a position of absolute, a top of 10, and a left of 5. So where do you think example 4 is now going to be positioned on my page? Any guesses? Remember, I gave it an absolute position, and I gave it a top of 10 and a left of 5. Well, actually, that was kind of a trick question, <laughs> because what it does actually do is it jumps all the way to the top left of the page for now. This is the number one important thing to understand about absolute positioning. For now, this is going to be relative to the page. But if I went in here and I gave my container a position of relative, I'm not even going to give it a top or a left. That's not important. The only important thing is I gave my container a position of relative, and I hit F5. Now the absolutely positioned element is relative to the location of the container. Meaning, I can move the container anywhere I want, and this absolutely positioned element will follow it. Okay, so how's everyone feeling? Okay, let's talk about the last form of, uh, so th is that kind of like an anchor? Uh, you could say that using the English definition of the word anchor, but I would avoid saying that because anchor in HTML, that's an A tag, so it has different meaning and it might confuse people. Okay, let's talk about the last type of positioning. It's positioned relative to its parent container, kind of. It's positioned relative to the first container that has a relative position attribute. Because if I were to remove this re position relative from the container, then it would const be constrained to the page. Okay, so for the next example, I'm actually going to change my um, example three down here. I'm going to move it to the top right of the page because that'll make what I'm about to show you guys a little bit more apparent. So I'm going to say right of 10 and top of 10. And that'll move that guy all the way to the top right. Next up, I'm going to take this p tag, I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to paste it a bunch of times. And the reason I'm doing this is because to show the next example, I need to have a scroll bar. Notice how when I scroll, everything gets scrolled away, including my absolutely positioned elements. Well, there's one more type of positioning. And that's called fixed. So I'm going to go ahead and create another div, and I'm going to call it example5. Say this is example5. I'm going to go into the CSS, and I'm going to say example5 has a background of, I don't know, let's do some gray again because I'm out of colors. Um, so at the moment, if I hit F5, here's example 5 down here, positioned statically, just like how we would expect it to be positioned. But watch what happens when I do this. 
and give it a position of fixed. Just by giving it the position of fixed, look at what it does. It fixes itself on the bottom of the page, no matter how far I scroll. Now I can actually override that behavior if I wanted to. I can go ahead and say, um, let's say I wanted it to appear on the top of the page, I could say top zero, left zero. Maybe I wanted it to be a width of 100% as well. Look at that. I have now fixed this to the top of the top left of the page and I've made its width contain or be as large as its parent element. No matter how far I scroll, it'll be fixed like that. So fixed positioning works very much like absolute positioning, except it is going to be fixed at the top of my page. So yeah, in fact, I can make this look even a little bit more visually pleasing and go ahead and give the padding of 10, maybe a font size of eight, eight points. And then I'll change it from this is example five to this is the title of the web application or something like that. Come back here and hey, look, we now have a fixed element. Unfortunately, that fixed element is now covering up my um, my other example. So let me go ahead and give the, my other example of top of 50 so that all the examples are visible. Whoops. I didn't mean that one. I meant you. There we go. Okay. So quick recap. There are four kinds of positioning for box level elements. There's static, which is the default, which is you can see static being pretty, well, static's used everywhere, obviously, for like right here, static's being used, right here, static's being used, and same with example one. That's all static positioning. Then we have relative positioning. Relative positioning allows us to offset our elements by X amount of pixels in either the X or Y dimensions, but it doesn't actually change how much space that element pushes away from other elements. Then we have absolute positioning. Absolute positioning allows us to place our elements anywhere on the page or anywhere that is constrained by an element that has relative positioning applied. So we see example three is constrained to the page, whereas example four is constrained to this parent element. That's because if I look at this parent element in my developer tools, you'll see that he has a relative positioning. If I were to take off that relative positioning, then this example four would jump away and be covered up by the last example. Finally, we have fixed positioning. Fixed positioning works very similarly to absolute positioning, except it is always going to be fixed on the page no matter how far away you scroll. You can't run away from it. So how's everybody feeling about positioning? Okay. So we talked about positioning, but now let's go ahead and bring that back into our example application. What I want is I want my navigation bar to be positioned in my header. So let's go ahead and do that. The first step is to, so I'm going to close out of example three and jump in, back into example two. The first step, as with all web development, is going to be writing our markup. So I'm not going to worry about the styles of our markup quite yet. I'm just going to worry about the markup itself. I'm going to create a nav element up here in my header. Inside of my nav element, I'm going to create an unordered list. Inside of my unordered list, I'm going to create some LIs. Each LI is going to have an anchor in it. And each anchor is going to say where it points to. So we have our dashboard, archive, about, and contact. 
This HTML that we're looking at right now is a very, very common pattern, and I, I hope people um, sort of just memorize it because you will see this used everywhere. Using the nav element, which is an element that's been introduced with HTML5, delineates our navigation. A UL or an unordered list is very commonly used to provide individual navigation items, which are inside of list items. And then our actual buttons that will cause us to navigate to a different page have to be in A tags, because remember, A tags are links. But if I went back to my to-do application and I hit F5, look what happens. This is obviously not desirable. We want to style these buttons so that they look like these tabs up here. So let's start off with the first problem that we have to face, and that's the positioning. I want to position the, this navigation at the top right of my header, or the bottom right of my head, header, rather. So to do that, I need to do two things. The first thing I need to do is I need to give this width container a position of relative. So how do I do that? Well, I want to select just this one width container. I don't want to select this width container. So I can go ahead and write a selector, which I think I've already written. Yep, yeah, this one right here. I want to select the width container that's inside of the header. And I'm going to give him a position of relative. After I give him a position of relative, I need to go into my UL and give him a position of absolute. So the way that I'm going to select my UL is I'm going to select, say, header, UL. And I'm going to give him a position of absolute. Then I'm going to give him a bottom of 0 pixels and a right of 10 pixels. If I go back to my page and refresh, look what happened. That's actually pretty cool, actually. That's pretty close to what I want, right? Um, I mean, it obviously doesn't look right yet, but it's actually being positioned appropriately. It is being positioned where I want it to. But we have a couple problems. The first problem is, is that ULs come with default padding and margins. I want to remove the padding and margins from my UL, and I want to remove these bullets. I don't know if you can see them through the video compression, but there are bulleted. Uh, the, each item is bulleted, which I don't want. So I'm going to give my UL a margin of zero to override the browser specific styles. I'm also going to give it a list style of none. When I hit F5, we got a little bit closer to what we want. We no longer, we have our contact being snug up against our header, which is what we want, and we no longer have our bullet lists. But now we have another problem. And that problem is, is that right now our UL is positioned vertically. So how do we make it not positioned vertically? Well, I'm going to write a selector that's going to select out my allies. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to set their margins to zero and their paddings to zero. I think that that's the default for Chrome, but I can't remember if it's the default for other browsers either. So I'm just going to reset my margins and paddings on my allies. Then I'm going to do something awesome. I'm going to give them all a float of left. Now when I come back to my page, we got a whole lot closer to what we're looking for. We now have our navigation snug up against the bottom right hand of our header, and we have it laid out in the exact way that we want, using floats. All that's left to do now is to style our buttons. That's it. So how do I select out my buttons? Well, I'm going to write a selector that's going to be header UL LI A. So that's going to say every A tag that's in a UL tag that's in a U, or the, every A tag that's in a li tag that's in a ul tag that's in a header tag is what I want to select, which fortunately is all of these headers or all of these anchors up here. The first thing that I need to do, however, I've been trying to say this terminology a lot um, so that it kind of slowly gets ingrained in people's heads, but all of the fun little positioning and margins and paddings and borders and all that great stuff we've been talking about all day, that stuff only actually works on block level elements. The anchor tag is not a block level element. The anchor tag is an inline element. 
So how do we apply things like borders and margins and paddings to an inline element? Well, we tell it that's no longer an inline element, it's now a block level element. So now that we've done that, we can now give our a tag the same kind of properties that we would give our other block level elements, such as padding, margin, backgrounds, and all that fun stuff. So I'm just going to toss out a couple properties right here, uh, just properties that, that'll look the way I want them to. Obviously, something like this is something that you just fiddle with, uh, probably within the development tools of Chrome itself, to get it to look the way you want it to. But at this point, I'm just trying to make it look a particular way. So I'm going to give it that padding. I'm going to give it a background of a light gray. I'm going to force the color of my A tags to no longer be blue. I want them to be black. I want to get rid of their underline by setting their text decoration to none. And I want to give it a border right of one pixel dotted and then A, a sort of lighter gray. And look at that. We now have a fancy little um, decor or fancy little navigation that looks kind of nice. So now let's do one more important thing, and then I'll do something fun. The important thing is I want to tell the user that they're on the dashboard right now. I want to highlight the dashboard link differently than the other links. The way to do that is I'm going to give the li that represents the page we're currently on, I'm going to give it a class. The class I'm going to give it is called active. That'll allow me to uniquely select the actual navigation element that we're under. Now obviously that's not going to do anything yet because I don't have any rules that take make use of it, but let's go ahead and do that right now. I'm going to write a selector of header ul li.active a. So by saying li.active, it means that this rule is only going to match li or a tags that are within an li tag that is active. And remember, we know it's active because we gave it that class. And then I'm going to toss in some rules. I'm going to go ahead and or some properties. I'm going to give it a background of white. The reason I'm giving it a background of white, that'll match the, the fancy little border I have underneath my header. And then I'm going to give it a cursor of default. The cursor of default is just going to make it so um, it's no longer a little pointer hand thingy when I hover over it. That's usually an appropriate thing to do for tabs that you already are selected. So that looks nice. So there's another thing that we, need, we kind of need to do from a user experience point of view. And that is we need to have a hover state of some sort. Um, if the user hovers over one of these links, I want to change their style slightly. To do that, I'm going to use something called a pseudo selector. And it's not as scary as it sounds. Whenever you see a colon like this, that is a, that's a pseudo selector. And pseudo selectors are just ways to select things off of different criteria. Hover is one of them. What I'm doing is I'm saying I want to only select, I, I only want this rule to be applied to an A tag that's inside of an LI tag that is hovered over at the moment. By doing that and refreshing, I now have a nice little rollover effect. And honestly, you, you guys are just, you're only constrained by your imagination. If I wanted to go back and do a CSS uh, gradient generator, and what would go good with that? I don't want to play with this too long, but I'm sure one of these will look pretty. Maybe this one. That has virtually no effect. Wow, it's just too subtle. Let's make it blue. Or no, someone said make it pink. Let's make it pink. 
Yeah, sorry, that, that grading was just too subtle for that small of an element. And we're still running into a situation where... Wow, it's like my CSS... Oh, I didn't save it. Derp. There we go. So again, remember, you are just limited by your imagination. Um, any combination of these rules will allow you to do lots of fun different things with your styles. Let's do one more fun thing before we move on. And that is the border radius. I want to give my um, first element a border radius that will make it rounded. Rounded corners in CSS have been asked for for I think pretty much since CSS was invented, and they used to involve lots of disgusting hacks that were ugly and required the use of images and everybody hated them. Well now, um, border radiuses are built into CSS itself, and they're supported by all the major browsers. But I have a problem, and that problem is, is I only want to select the first LI to give him one corner to be rounded. I don't want everything to be rounded. Like, for example, if I went in and I made every A tag rounded by giving them a border radius of three pixels, that's not going to look very good. It looks rather ugly, actually. So I only want the first one, and I only want his top left border to be rounded. So how do I select the first element out of a list of elements? Well, that introduces us to another pseudo selector that I find is, is fairly easy to understand, and that is the first child. So what I could do here is I can say header ul li colon first child a. I can do border top left radius three pixels. So remember, this is another pseudo selector, but what it'll do is it'll only return the first child that matches this element. So that looks a lot better. Okay, so how's everyone feeling about our navigation bar? Okay. So we still have one more bit to do, and this is going to combine every single thing that we've worked with today. Um, the reason I wanted to show this is because it combines all the different things that we've done today in a very unique way. Um, so I really encourage people to follow along with this um, later, because this, like I said, this does do some pretty fancy stuff, but it just mostly, besides with one exception, it does everything that we've been talking about with floating and positioning and displaying and all that fun stuff. So let's start off with the HTML. The HTML of what we're going to write um, is pretty straightforward. It's very similar to what we've written before, actually, with very minor modifications. So I'm going to open up my width container right here. And then I'm going to create another divider. And I'm going to call this to-do container. And I'm going to apply the clear fix to it preemptively because I happen to know for a fact that the stuff inside of the to-do container is going to be floating. Then I'm going to write three sections, just like what we did last week. Each section is going to have an H1. We'll have a to-do today, to-do tomorrow, and to-do future. Then, inside of each one of these sections, we'll also have an OL. I'm going to give this OL a very specific class, class to work on. I'm going to call the OL to-do list. And that's because I don't, in this particular case, I'm not going to feel comfortable selecting the OLs and assuming they're all to-do lists. I very well in the future might want to add another OL that isn't a to-do list, and I don't want my styles to conflict with it. So I'm going to give each one of these lists a special class that I'll be able to latch onto. Next up, we're going to have our items. 
Now, remember before how we had our items and we used the um, we used the del tag to say it was finished and the strong tag to say that it was important. I'm going to switch that up a little bit. To give us a little bit more flexibility with how we can style our application, I'm actually going to apply a class to each one of the LIs that describes the state of the current item. So I'm going to say item one is finished. So is item two. But I want item three to be important. The next thing that I want is I want my allies to have a button on them. Every I want every to-do item that isn't completed to have a button on it that will allow me to mark it as completed. So I'm going to add an a tag with an href of pound, which is basically a no-op, and I'm going to give it the value of x to say that this is the button that if you click on it will finish this item. Okay. So I have one to-do list done. I'm just going to copy and paste this for the other ones because it's not that important. Maybe maybe we'll have fewer items finished on our to-do tomorrow list. So I'll just make those have no classes on their LI. I'll keep one as important. But because these are no longer finished, I want to add the button back in. And then to-do future, I'll just leave the same thing as to-do today. It doesn't really matter. We have enough to work with already. The final thing I want to do is I want to add an add button. At the top of each one of these H1s, I want to add a button that makes it to where if you click it, you can add an item. Now remember, we're not actually building functionality here, but if you were to actually be writing this application, you would certainly want a button available to the user that would bring up maybe a dialog box that allowed them to type in what they wanted to have added to the list. So like usual, I'm going to throw in an A tag and I'm going to give it a text of plus. So I'm going to jump back to my application and I'm going to refresh and this is what we get. And how many people here believe me that this markup could basically be turned into what we see right here in the completed application? I mean come on, it's, it's pretty crazy what you can do with this stuff. So let's play around with it. The first thing I want to do is I want to put these into columns. I want three columns, and I want the columns to have equal widths. More importantly, as I scroll down the application, I want those columns to stay sized to where it doesn't cause any layout issues. I want them to be exactly 33.33% in width. So let's start off with that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write a selector that will select each one of my sections inside of my to-do container. Remember, each one of these sections defines one of our lists. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the, give them a float of left and a width of 33.333%. Then I'll go back to it, hit refresh, and I'm not exactly getting what we want because I, for some reason, did not know how to type in percents properly. So maybe you shouldn't believe me that I'm able to do this. <laughs> okay, so here we go. We have three elements and they're all positioned into columns of equal width. And as I move the page down, they also resize themselves according to the percentage. So that's cool. But I also want to, let's go ahead and style our headers first, because the moment we style our headers, we're going to run into a very obvious problem, a problem that is not going to be trivial to solve. And it's going to be the last thing that we're going to introduce today. So I want to select all my H1s. So to do that, I'll do to-do container H1, because I want to select every single H1 that's inside the to-do container. Now, what I'm going to give them is I want them to have, um, here's just some values that I already came up with. So I'm going to want a font size of 10 points. Again, I, I came up with these values literally by just playing around with them in my developer tools. That's it. And that's all you really have to do to get things to look the way you want them to. Give it a padding of 5 pixels, 
give it a padding of, or margin of zero pixels. Um, let's go ahead and give it a border of 1px dotted light gray. And let's give it a border top left radius of three pixels and a border top right radius of three pixels. Now I'm gonna add, now I want to add in a background. So because I want to add in a background, I'm going to go to the ultimate CSS gradient generator and I'm going to find the background that I want. Um, that's close to what I want actually, but I maybe want this to be a little darker. There we go. And I'm going to copy that off and I'm going to paste it into my code. Coming back to my application, we have what looks like this. So we already see some problems. Let's fix our, let's, before we get to some of our positioning problems, let's fix our plus symbol right here. I want the plus symbol to move over here so it looks kind of pretty. So to do that, I'm going to go back into my code. I want to select the A, the A tag inside of the H1 tag. So to do that, I'm going to say to do container h1a. First, I'm going to give a display of block. Remember, I want this to act like a block level element, so I can do things like add margins and paddings and floating to it. Next up, the way that I'm going to position this is I want to position this absolutely. I want to have a top of zero and a right of zero. I want to give it a color of green. I'll give it um, the same vertical padding as the H1 so it fits snugly up against it. But then I want to give it maybe some more horizontal padding to make it look a little nicer. I'll do text decoration of none to get rid of that nasty underline. I'll do a font weight of bold. And I'll give it a border left of one pixel dotted four, which is a dark gray. Now, can anybody tell me what I'm forgetting? Remember, what I just did was I told this little A tag to be absolutely positioned. Which means if I refresh, where did my A tags go? They went all up here. I want to constrain where these A tags are positioned to my headers. And I can do that by giving my header a position of relative. Now when I come back, I have an awesome little green plus button. So that's cool. The next thing that I want to do is I don't like how this is these sections are so close to the header. So how do we fix that? Well, on my to do containers dot section or my to do container space section, I give it a margin top of ten pixels. So that's looking a lot better. But we still have a very, very big problem that will require the use of something new and fancy. And that very, very big problem is that our sections are snug up against each other because they're all ac ac or they're all exactly 33.3% in width, which 33.333% times 3 is just about 100. So there's no padding in between them. How do we do that? What if you like it? Well, well, if you like it, you can just keep it like that, I guess. But I don't like it. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, there's a couple ways that you might think that you could do this or fix this. One of the ways that I, I've, I see used is a lot of people with previous versions of CSS will add an additional element inside each one of these sections to give the padding. The reason they do that is watch what happens when I add a padding of 10 pixels to my elements. Whoops, I just arrow shook everything out of... I hate arrow shake. I really, really do, by the way. Does anybody ever use arrow shake? I don't even know. Okay. So I added padding. 
But now we have another problem. The problem is, is if you recall, when I specified the width of a container, or the width of an element, that width only applies to the content of the element. So the content of the element is 33.33% of the width of the parent, but then I add the padding to it on top of it, and the padding will completely mess up my layout and actually cause my floated containers to start stacking on each other, which is not desirable. Now, so you might say, well, can't you subtract your padding from your content width? The answer is kind of yes, but mostly no. Um, I can't combine a percent width with a subtraction of an absolute pixel width. Now you can in some newer browsers, but this feature is not supported very widely yet. There is one feature that is introduced with CSS3 that is widely supported by most everything. Um, and whenever I say most of everything, I mean everything plus the recent versions of Internet Explorer. And that is an attribute that actually changes the way the box model calculates the size of an element. If that sounds confusing, all I'm going to do here is I want my width to include my padding. I want that to include it. So to do that, we can introduce a new property. And I'm going to have two of these, and you'll see why in a second. And that's the box sizing property. I can give a box sizing of border box. Then I also have to do a moz box sizing of border box, because unfortunately the newest versions of Firefox do not actually support the unprefixed box sizing attribute. By giving this attribute to my element, what it's going to do is the width will now include my padding. Which means that I can now give it a percent width, but I can also have paddings, margins, and borders inside of my elements. So watch what happens when I modify my padding. You see the 33.3% now includes all of the padding that I add to those elements, which allows me to perform more complex things. Yeah, so it doesn't flow to the next line because it's no longer being pushed away by its padding. Now remember, the moz prefix, this is a vendor specific prefix, is uh, the prefix for Firefox. Moz is short for Mozilla. Remember that a lot of the features of CSS3 aren't technically finalized yet, and what browser vendors do is they introduce those features using vendor-specific prefixes. However, these vendor-specific prefixes are on their way out and shouldn't be used to the extent that you can get away with it. Unfortunately, the latest version of Firefox requires that the box sizing is prefixed with MOZ but that won't be true for very much longer. Okay, so we've gotten quite a bit done here, but we're not there yet. So far we have our boxes being sized properly. Um, yes, the, somebody asked, so Mozilla, or so Firefox ignores the first one. Yes, Firefox will ignore this. Um, once uh, browser specific or vendor specific prefixes go away, you won't have to update anything because CSS is built in such a way that any unrecognized attribute is ignored. So you don't have to modify your code. Once Mozilla catches up, then it will recognize the normal W3C attribute of box sizing. Okay. So Here's what we have right now, but I want to go ahead and give our elements some attributes, some styling to make them look a little bit nicer. So let, let's make it look like what we have up here. I'll start off with getting rid of those numbers on our OLs and changing our font sizes and our paddings a little bit. So 
let's start off with doing the OLs. Remember how I gave each of my OLs a to-do list class? That means it's really easy for me to select those. I can just do dot to-do list. Now, I'm going to get rid of his margin, his padding, and his list style. Then what I'm going to do is I want to go ahead and give him a font size. I want to give him a font size of 10 points. Next up, I want to do to-do list li. My li tags are going to have, or li elements are going to have a padding of 0 pixels and 5 pixels and a padding left of 7 pixels. Now, there's a million ways to specify this. I could have done this all in one line. However, I just got in the habit of doing it like this. So what this means is, actually, I could have simply done, um, whoops, I forgot something. I actually want a padding of 5 pixels followed by a padding left of 7 pixels. There we go. So what this means is, is I want all of my padding to be 5 pixels, but my padding left I want to override to be 7 pixels. Next up, I want to clear out the margin just in case the browsers have any specific styling on that. Um, I want to give it a cursor of pointer, which we'll see what that cur mouse cursor looks like in a moment. And that should actually be about it. So now our items look like this. So that looks nice, but we can do better. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give my allies a border bottom of 1px, how about dotted uh, f, so that's white. And it's a very subtle effect, but I like it. Next up, I want to style my finished items. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say to do list li.finished. By doing the li.finished, it will select out all the li tags that have the finished classed on them. And what do I want to do, want to do with them? Well, how about let's give them a background of red, a text decoration of line through, and an opacity of 0.6, or maybe 0.7 might look better. Eh. That doesn't look right. What did I use here? Ah. I'm actually going to change the background to an RGBA. That'll look better. So I'll give an RGBA of red. So that's 255 for the red channel, 0 for the green, 0 for the blue, and I'll give it 0.5 for the alpha. Now that looks a little bit better. Maybe I'll bring the opacity back up to 1. There we go. I like that. So what about important items? Well, important items, I want to highlight green, like what we see right here. Not only do I want to highlight them, I also want to give them a nice little visually distinct border marker right there. So to do that, I'm first going to select them, which is the first thing that you have to do whenever you do any styling, is select it. Remember how I gave some allies the class of important? Well. I was just able to use the selector to grab them. I'm going to give them a border left of 5 pixels solid green, and I'm going to give it a background of RGBA uh, 0, 255, 0 0.5. So again, that's 0 in red, 100% in green, 0 in blue, and 0.5 in alpha. Well, notice the problem. When I hit a 5, we have our nice little highlighted green things, which look kind of nice, but we have a small positioning problem. Notice how these item th threes no longer line up to the items that don't have borders. Well, the easiest way to fix this is to change the padding of this one element, or of finished elements. Remember how they have a padding left of 7 pixels? Well, if I gave this one element a padding left of two pixels, then it will line up with everything. And we know that because of some simple math. This element is being pushed over to the right by five pixels because he has a five pixel border. These elements are not being pushed over. So to compensate for that, 
I have to subtract 5 from my padding in order to get them to line up. And what's 7 minus 5? It's 2. And now they line up. So the last thing that I want to do here is I want to position my, my little X guys right there. My little, uh, my little finish buttons. So to do that, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to give a class to these A tags. And I'm going to call the, these A tags, um, I don't know, how about finish? So all the A tags get a finish class. And remember, be very judicial or very um, cautious when adding classes to your code because it could make things more difficult to understand. But in this case, I have a very specific reason why I want to do this. I want there to be the possibility of more than just the finish button being inside these allies. So I want to preemptively distinguish these A tags from other A tags. Okay, so to position my, um, my finished, this is where things are going to get a little fun. Um, actually, no, they're really not going to get fun, because basically I'm going to do exactly what I did with my headers, aren't I? So what I do with my headers? Well, I gave the parent a relative position. Then I selected my buttons. So I'm going to do to do dash list dot remove for my remove buttons. Then I'm going to give them a position of absolute, a top of zero, a right of zero to make them appear to the right. Um, what else should I give them? I want their padding to match up vertically, but not necessarily horizontally. And then I want to give them a opacity of 0 0.2 give them a text decoration of none, a background of black, and a foreground of white. That should look pretty good. Um, if I got the names right. <laughs> there we go. I'm selecting off my finished class. And hey, look at that. Our buttons are now all, all the way over there. The last thing I want to do with my buttons, however, is I want them to have a special hover state. When I hover over them, I want them to turn red. So to do that, I'll use the hover pseudo selector. I'll give them a background of red, and I'll up their opacity to, how about 0.7? That might look good. And there we go. And so remember, the, the point of these buttons here are to, when you click on it, have it remove the item from our to-do list. So because in the absence of having any icons we can play with, which we will be talking about next week, um, I'm just using an X to say this is a remove button. So notice how my already finished items don't have a remove button. Actually, one more thing that might make it a little bit nicer is if I lined up my remove buttons with my add buttons. So let's take a look at how we could do that. Our add buttons have a padding of 5px and 10px. Our remove buttons have the same. What happens if we up that? Um, actually, I think it's because they're not lining up because the add buttons have a font weight of bold. There we go. So I'm going to go ahead and make my X's bold. And I'm going to give them a border left of 1px dotted. Let's do something really subtle. Let's do um, D. That's way too subtle. Let's just do the same color that we did on these guys uh, for dark gray. and make sure that we actually save our CSS file before we refresh. And make sure we save a little bit harder. Ah, oh, never mind, that's just because of the opacity. Okay. So this is about where I wanted to get to today. Um, we'll talk about these little hover menus next week.
which are again implemented entirely in CSS. But for now, we'll just go ahead and leave it like this because we got, went through a lot of incredibly important stuff uh, as far as floating and positioning and sizing and pretty much the backbone to any website is the concept of positioning and floating. And we saw a few very interesting examples of it. The simplest example of it is going to be a, the basic sidebar. I mean, how many web pages do you go to that have a sidebar? It's very common to see. And that's the simplest thing that we can do with floating. The next thing that's also very popular is a navigation bar, which we did up here simply by setting our floats appropriately. Then finally, we went through a little bit of more of a complex example with having three columns that are sized in the same way being displayed using only CSS and without any scripting. So how's everyone feeling? Alrighty, so for homework, um, same sort of deal as last time I want people to see, or I want to see people reproduce this, that the act of typing it out and making mistakes along the way is the best way to solidify your knowledge. And we've been through all of the code multiple times here. Then I want people to write an archive page, an about page, and a contact page. So these buttons will be clickable. And I want the navigation to appear the exact same on each one of the pages. Now, I know what you're going to ask. Well, if the HTML for the header is the same for every single page, then how could we consolidate them? And the answer to that is a lot more complex than what I want to go into. The simple answer is you can't using pure HTML and CSS. So you will have to duplicate some of your code in order to get your header to appear on all four pages. As far as the content inside of each page that is less important, um, I would like to see examples of sidebars in particular because this is such a common thing to do in CSS, but you don't have to. The biggest, the biggest achievement is going to be getting this page working locally on your own computer, as well as having links that actually go to different pages up at the top. Alrighty. So I guess to all the future people, I will see you guys later.